we are witnessing is as a result of the toil and the sweat of the Ghanaian people, coupled with what I've already uh, mentioned, the uh, high prices of crude oil on the international market. And it is not something that government should be bragging about because like um, the expert said, Mr. Jackson said, this does very little to improve the current, you know, malice we have on our hands as a country. You see, what the finance minister is trying to do is that he's trying to paint a rosy picture of an economy in tatters, an economy in shambles. But investors can see through this PR gimmick, okay? And they can, they can see through this PR gimmick because they know the reality on the ground. They know the facts and the figures. And so these rhetorics will, will not address the economic problems or quagma we currently find ourselves in. What am I talking about? The major concern for Ghanaians as we speak today, or let me say one of the major concerns, has to do with the alarming depreciation of the Ghana city. Since January, the city has depreciated by almost 40%. And if you do a trend analysis of the performance of the city against the US dollar in the last two, three months, you realize that the city is not doing any better as against its major international trading currencies, as the finance minister will have us believe. On the 1st of August, the city was selling at ACD's 90 pesos. This is, these are figures I got from. Um, my Forest Bureau friends. 1st of August, 8.9. By the 10th of August, the city had gone up to 9.35. 20th August, it had gone up to 10.15. By 1st September, it, has see, it had seen some relative stability that had come down to 10.1 because it was at the time that we got the free exam facility of 750 million. million. But as that began to fizzle out by the... 10th of September, you needed 10 CDs, 25 pesos to get a dollar. 20th September, 10 CDs, 35 pesos. 25th, uh, 25th September, 10 CDs, 45 pesos. As of yesterday, when I checked, 30th September, the dollar was selling at 10 CDs, 65 pesos. So at this rate, the dollar will hit 11 Ghana CDs in the next one or two weeks. Well, the finance minister is talking about the confidence of how this COCO syndicated loan, which we signed yesterday, would impact on the forex situation. In fact, the strengthening of the city going forward, $1.3 billion that's coming in. We've always had COCO syndication loans in the last quarter of the fiscal year. If you look at the pressure on the Ghana city, the question is whether or not the COCO syndication loan we'll be getting this year will be enough, okay, will be enough to cushion the Ghana city against the US dollar especially. Obviously, we are going to see some temporary artificial stability, but that will not be sustainable. As that begins to fizzle out, we are going to see an alarming depreciation of the Ghana city. And that is why local banks like APSA are predicting that this, the dollar will hit 12 Ghana cities by the end of December. Because don't also forget that demand for dollars in the last quarter of every fiscal year in this year, goes up astronomically. And so we should not just be looking at um, what government is doing artificially to so show up the city that relative to the COCO syndication loan, but we should also be looking at the demand you know, side of, of, of the issue. And demand is going to go way up. And if the projections our own local banks are making uh, is anything to go by, then the city will not be doing any better, even in the last quarter of this year. And I don't see how the finance minister can look Ghanaians in the face, okay, at a time the city has depreciated by over 40% and say that we are doing, the economy is improving. Again, look at inflation. Inflation is not doing any better. Three months ago, the rate of inflation was less than 30%. Today, the rate of inflation is 34%. And... It is very clear that as the CD continues to depreciate, being one of the major push factors of the uh, 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 hyperinflation we are witnessing, 
inflation is going to go further up. And if we are not lucky, it will cross 35, 36, 37% by the last quarter of this year. And once the rate of inflation is going up, it means that the rate of change in prices will be going up. And that is going to impose on two hardships on the Ghanaian people. But you see, in all these things, in this conversation, the most important thing that we need to look at to come to the conclusion or the, the, the opinion that the economy is doing better or not is really about the public debt. It's about the public debt because that, that is what the investor community, both local and external, are mostly concerned about. And the signs are clear that our public debt is not sustainable. We'll get and and, and mm -hmm. just to wrap up, and mm -hmm. that I am very sure of will be the outcome of the ongoing debt sustainability analysis that the IMF and the Bank of Ghana are engaging. And so if your debt position is unsustainable and that is not improving and your risk of debt default is on the ascendancy for which reason Fitch has further downgraded you below junk status to CC and all that, further dampening investor confidence in your economy, then you are sitting on a, a time bump. Mm -hmm. And so no amount of PR gimmicks or lofty rhetorics, you know, like the finance minister is doubling in, can salvage the situation we find ourselves in. The situation we find ourselves in, Alfred, calls for candor. It calls for honesty. That is the only way the investor community can, you know, have some confidence in the mitigation measures we are trying to put place uh, with the IMF. We're getting to the, the total debt situation and the debt sustainability analysis as to how our debt is either sustainable or otherwise. Obviously, that is the focus of the IMF team in town at the moment. But Professor Lord Mensah, bringing in here at this point, yes, it is modest growth. The finance minister himself, in his own words, says it is modest. But you juxtapose that with the, the overall picture and the current state of affairs. And then this IMF engagement we're having. How will this latest development in Q2 impact on the current state of affairs? Prof. Yeah, well, um, if you ask me, I would say that I will not look at the, just the GDP growth alone to say that our economy is doing well. Because the economy is a system of indicators put in place. Now, you are looking at your growth being about 4.8% in quarter two. That is more or less saying that your asset, as far as the Ghanaian economy is concerned, has grown by 4.8%. On the other side, your liabilities, which our debt forms part of it, which salaries and emolument payments forms part of it. You can see clearly that a lot of labor agitations are ongoing, a lot of um, um, requests from the public that what they are earning is not making up with, you know, um, how inflation is skyrocketing. And these are anticipated, you know, request from the labor market is more or less one of your liabilities, which in the end turns up to be growing. So if for nothing at all, these workers may want maybe a salary increment that is likely to meet up with inflation. So if inflation is um, about 33.9, um, it's a, a typical rational labor may want his salary to be increased to catch up with this average inflation. And of course, we all know that our household inflation is more than that, you know, 33.9%. Um, and from where I sit, my household inflation is more than 50%. So effectively, a typical rational, you know, worker would demand a salary increase, which is more than that 33.9%. That is a liability on your public balance sheet. So by, you know, transmission, we're saying that going forward, your likely increase in your, you know, um, 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 public 
you know, um, pest liability from the side of the salaries alone should be around 39 point something percent. Not to talk about how exchange rate growth has built up into our, the growth of our debt. So if you relate this to, it tells you that that GDP growth, which is about 4.8, will have nothing to do, will not be able to, you know, neutralize the possible growth that we are expecting from the liability side. So effectively, it tells you that you know, indeed, it is a moderate growth because when you relate it to the, you know, the, 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 the debt and the possible increase in salaries, um, you will see that the, the, the 4.8 growth is nothing to write about. And again, let's look at the concentration of the growth and how it can trickle down to the ordinary person. You see, when we talk about economic growth, this economy was realizing about 7% 7 growth just before the COVID. Just before the COVID, 7.5, almost 7.8 there about. It was difficult for even a typical Ghanaian to fill that growth in his pocket. And at the point in time, my comment was that the economy is still hanging at the macro level. And so at what point would it you know, transmit to the doorstep of the ordinary Ghanaian? We're on it, waiting for this transmission to take place because we were hearing of exchange rate, you know, being stable. We're hearing of uh, what we call interest rate being low. We're hearing of all the economic, macroeconomic indicators being friendly for a typical country which is of sound, you know, economic situation. So we were waiting that gradually, but looking at policies being rolled out by the government, we're going to have this macroeconomic, you know, growth transmit to the doorstep of the Ghanaian. Then, suddenly, COVID came in. Then, we were battling with COVID all through. Of course, during COVID, it was only government who would be spending because when economic activities get freezed at the individual and the business level, it is anticipated that it's only government that will be in business. That means that the economy will still be hanging at the level of what? Government. Then, after COVID, Ukraine came in. So, if you look at the build-up, clearly it tells you that even the 4.5 growth may not be felt by the ordinary Kenyan. And that is why I started by saying that if you look at clearly what is on the ground, that 4.8 growth in the economy, which is the asset side of our economy, may not necessarily be to neutralize the possible liabilities that this economy is carrying. The liabilities in terms of interest payment, in terms of interest payment as a result of, you know, exchange rate growth, right. and then possible labor requests that will be on the table in the next few, you know, uh, months that the government should anticipate because, you know, Ghanaians are really struggling to make ends meet. I see. Well, we talk about labor demands. The likes of UTAG and others have already served notice of what they call an unprecedented labor uh, unrest if there is no intervention by government in the coming days. And also joining me now, Dennis Miracles Abouji is the Director of Local Government and Decentralization and Rural Development at the Presidency. The Miracles, good morning to you. Morning. Welcome. Morning. Great. Now, yes, the modest growth rate of 4.8%, my guests have had their take on it. The Ghanaian people have also been talking any growth in real GDP will be a reference point for government going into this program. But how much of a difference does it make in the bigger picture, trickling down to the impact that it would have on the Ghanaian people? That's the focus that the people are asking for now. Mr. Abadi. Alfred, um, very warm good morning to Mr. Jackson. Um, good to see you and my brother Sami. Apologies for coming quiet late. I, I think that ultimately, um, no matter how we look at it, any slight positive growth is, is good for the country, irrespective of the challenges that um, we will still have to, have to deal with. Um, if we are having a growth of even 10% and we still do not have the people feeling it, it's not the same as having a negative growth and the people still not feeling it. 
So for, for that, what I would say is that we need to continue, you know, working towards ensuring we, 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 we have a continuous sight of the, of the positive growth. There are very key things that um, we need to be able to do as a nation for, for our people to really begin to feel all the other economic interventions that, we, that, that we, we do. We can't run away from these things. And these are things that we've always been belaboring its, its conversations. And what, what we would have to talk about rather is whether government is showing and um, working towards putting these things in place. And for me, um, anytime I hear Sami, Sami talk, those are the sort of things I would want to hear, hear him say. But I think we are getting, all of us, uh, we are getting so tired with the, with the same convo, especially coming from, from, from Sami. I am a politician, so it's Sami that I, I, I would speak to. I, I won't speak to you know, Mr. Well, Joe Jackson well, and, and all of that. Because, because Alfred, well, I'll continue they, to say that. They have all not said anything different from what no, Sami is well, saying, if, I, voters, I, if you I want would, to respond to him. I would, I would respond to him. And, and I think that we are, we are getting tired. They need to be a bit more creative when it comes to the conversation. Opposition has two responsibilities. One is to criticize as much as possible and get political gains out of it. That is allowed. But the second most important responsibility of the opposition is to tell the people what your alternative policies are. So after all these belabored points, then you tell the people of Ghana that give us leadership and we'll do A, B, C, D. It's been almost three, four years, and we haven't heard anything from, from them. But key for us as a government is that we need to be able to stimulate our, our economic environment in a way that private sector will thrive, and the people will be more productive, so their are, they are earnings will go up, and be able to be, at least be able to stay, stay afloat. This government has shown the way. If not for anything at all, we consistently have said that the industrialization drive and the agenda that this government is embarking on it's something that in the long term would, would show the results that, that we are looking for. How are people going to feel this in their pockets? If you go to my, my, my hometown in Latte, the only way the people in Latte would feel that there's some growth in the economy is when this morning, when he wakes up, he has enough to be able to cater for his family, pay his bills, and probably also some dis disposables to, to be able to take care of, take care of his, own, his own luxury as, as well. If we are not there yet, then we are going to have issues. But how do we get there? Industries, the jobs, private but you sector. you admit that we are not there yet. Yes, of Whether course. Your person we, at Latte will wake up and the cost of all these things you talk about are so high and the person still struggles to even get those. We are not there yet. Alfred, you see, one, one, of the, one of the things we should also admit, and the experts are here, we cannot pretend that we've been in normal times in the last three years. That is fact. There is not even a single country that is not having the discussion we are having here right now. All the superpower countries, all of them, they are all having the conversations. Even those that would say are not struggling as much as we are, are still having the conversations. Today, the, we are talking about the depreciation of the CD against the dollar. Look at the pound against the dollar. Look at the euro against the dollar. Go to the United States. They are crying over the cost of, um, of fuel. They are crying over the cost of the... Uh, they are living ex expenses as against their income. Go to the UK. It's been barely two weeks, and the people of the United Kingdom are already passing a vote of no confidence in their finance minister and their prime minister. Today, I read that Netherlands is around 17% uh, in, in terms of inflation. If you go to our neighboring countries, who are usually anchored on the French economy and have been doing so well over the period, today they used to record 0.5%, 1% of inflation. Ivory Coast and Co. are doing 5%, 6% inflation. Turkey, one of our major trade partners, where we import a lot of things from today, are doing 80% inflation. Alfred, the experts are here. We cannot pretend as if this is a unique situation to Ghana. That notwithstanding, we can also absorb ourselves from all the blame, and I've always said it, I said it the last time Sabi and I were here, that the situation we find ourselves are partly our own domestic doings, but largely also as a result of the global pressures. Because if not for the unforeseen global pressures that we've suffered in the last three years, yes, we have our own challenges, we have our own mess that we are dealing with, but I don't think we'd have gotten to the point where we are now, because we would, we would have been able to manage and, and sail through. Here you are. A country that doesn't have the building blocks, we've been fighting for industrialization, industrialization, ensuring that private sector will thrive. A government comes in place. The government ensures that 
quickly we introduce this industrialization drive, invite private sector to, to contribute to it, then we took off. Factories here and there, people start mobilizing and getting these industries across the country. At the same time, this government is investing in human resource, ensuring that no Ghanaian child is left at home, so that by the time these industries speak, the human resource, the needed human resource is available to be able to support that. We are doing a lot in CVET to ensure that the needed skills and technical cap capabilities are there. We can smile these things off, laugh these things off, but these are real actions that if not for anything at all, every country that aspires to get to the point where we want to get to should be doing. Then, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I think Dr. Mensah mentioned it, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, bam, we come into the situation of COVID. We had to, at some point, halt and freeze a lot of things. Even areas that we invest in, we had to divert to ensure that we fight off COVID. Just when we're about to recover from COVID, we have the superpowers, Russia, Ukraine, which is not only affecting us. The Russia-Ukraine war is affecting even countries that we trade with. So even if the war, the bombs are not falling in Ghana, the effects are on our trade partners. So we are feeling the pinch. The question we should be answering this morning before we go to any other thing is that, do we admit and agree that what we are discussing this morning is not unique to only Ghana and peculiar to us, and that this conversation and discussion is happening all over the world? Once we are done with that, then we'll come and now have a conversation and say, but we caused our own mess some way, somehow, because there are certain things that if we had done mm -hmm. over the years, we would have at least built some shock absorbers to be able to withstand these things. So we shouldn't act like ostriches and pretend and be, and that is why I said that. When it comes to Sami, it's fair. He can do his politics as much as he wants. But what is the alternative? We have shown what it is that we are doing to ensure that we recover as a nation. So, and the finance minister has been very clear since I get, March. I consistently, get, I get you, the if, you me, if you could let me land. You, as you consistently, up. the finance minister has been engaging us and trying to explain how we we'll get ourselves out of the mess. Whether we like it or not, we are there. Our debts are high. The government has never run away from it. If you listen to the finance minister, he has admitted that our debts are high. And if our debts are high, there are several reasons why the debts are high. I, I understand that, and, and of course, Mr. Joe Jackson is here. Our debt portfolio now is made up of almost about 40% of the, of the exchange rate differentials, if I, if I, if I hear so. So our, our, our poor CD performance is even increasing our debt stock as well. But these are things that the finance minister has not run away from them and has indicated clearly in his recent statement how he believes that based on the things that we are putting in place, we'll be able to get out of this. L listen, we've done this before. When we came in 2016, the situation we found ourselves is no different from where we are today. Well, Dennis, but so we managed you, you, to get you, ourselves you, you, you out you of it. You made the point. So whereas we, and I always say this, that there's some convenience in doing the analysis with the global situation. Is it not true? We are, we are is not it a lie? Alone, which is, which is, I think we've underscored that so is it, over is it time. fact? Yes. Exactly. But you also now admit that it is not all about the global situation. That's mm. where we are, where we are yeah. now. You, we have also contributed to where we are now, exactly. correct? That's, that's established. Yeah. It's a miracle. Yes, that's It is not just about no, the global situation. No, that's established, and I've said it consistently. Okay. If you yeah. have a country that okay. is highly, highly import-driven and is basically exporting just raw raw forms of everything that they have. You should expect this. If you have a country so, that is importing everything from Turkey, then if so, Turkey's inflation goes to 80%, you are basically the, importing the most into important your country. issue now is, is what's been done. You see, because in all those other countries you make reference to, yes, there's a global situation, but there are specific interventions that have been put in place to ensure that those countries better manage the impact of the crisis that we are all faced with now. But what has been done in our situation is where the most important issue is. Look, I take a look at this. Um, Mr. Jackson, I'll come back to you. Um, the issue about how this trickles down to the ordinary Ghanaian, because what we are saying has to make sense to, to the people. Okay? We went to a bakery. Bread is, is one of the components captured in the inflation basket, which has seen an astronomical rise in price. Take a look. <laughs> It's this same business that took care of our children's education. But now, we don't make any profit. 
It's six o'clock in the morning, and workers here are going about their usual business. Only this time, things appear different. I think it's four million, Madrid three million, and some here fifty million. Sugar is 400 cities, margarine is 300, and flour is 1,500. We are suffering and don't make any profits. The one city loaf is no more, and the size of the two city one has been drastically reduced. Regular clients are unable to keep up with the trend. Sure, a lot of you can relate to this. Mr. Jackson. <laughs> I have to say this, that this is, for me, it's very emotive. Why? My mother was a baker, baking earthenware ovens. I grew up kneading bread, baking bread. In Teshinungwa, her bakery was called Keep Smiling Bakery. This is a, a bakery in Insuam. Yes. Tree. But this was in Dutchland when we're using the same earthenware ovens. Listen, in the bakery industry and several of us, and, and you said something, you said some of, some of the baskets that you, you take for inflation are over 80%. I'm not challenging the basket used by the uh, statistical service, but I'm just saying that if I take some of the baskets, they're over 80%. And why are we surprised when you look at the depreciation of the CD and you say, and, and, and you hear this woman crying? Everyone is crying. My staff are crying. My costs have gone up. So there's no running away from that. And, and, and I wanted to say something about this uh, Ukraine and uh, COVID situation. Look at me here. Look at my size. Right? If I jumped onto the edge of this table, all of you say, Mr. Jackson, what's wrong with you? You're standing at the edge of the table, you fall. Okay, so I'm standing here balancing out. Then Miracles, who is much smaller than me, tips me over. The miracle caused me to fall. Yes. But you're standing on the edge of the table. You left no room for you to step back. And that's the issue we are raising, that we have been standing at the edge for so long. And, and, and we, 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 yes, uh, uh, COVID was an issue. Yes, Ukraine was an issue. But what were we doing standing at the edge of the table? Someone to say, Joe, you're stupid. Look at your side, standing at the edge of this table. And when miracle tips you over, what happens? The key thing is this, over and over again, we miss opportunities to restructure this economy. We miss opportunities to, to, to make fundamental change this time. And so each iteration, the situation gets worse. Now we've hit rock bottom. Our people are feeling it, feeling it in a harsh way. We are in the risk of default. We've got, to, we've got to say, what are we going to do to get out of this situation? We're tired of laying, me, uh, 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 laying blame. We're tired of, I'll be honest with you, me personally, I'm tired of both of you. I'm tired. I'm tired of what the NBC says. I'm tired of what the MPP says because it doesn't change anything. We're tired. Let's solve the problem. Let's put mechanisms in place where we won't end up again in this same place we've been to the imf 16 times we are like an addict we're tired and and if honestly when i was listening to you i'm saying what am what are we doing here guys what are we doing here miracles is saying that he's preaching the same gospel <laughs> forgive me Sammy. you're preaching the same gospel but it doesn't change my life Sorry, that was my own personal rant. Hmm. Mr. Jeffy. Yes. Um, the first thing I want to say is that 
when we come on this platform, we don't come here with our own topics. And we come here to discuss issues that you put on the table. Indeed. So the question you've asked us this morning um, has to do with the claims by government of some modest, modest uh, growth that has been attained and how that can translate into the lives of the ordinary Kenyan. You've not asked me sitting here as the National Communications Officer of the NDC what the policy alternatives of the NDC are. This is not a conversation to discuss the policy alternatives of the NDC. If that is what you want us to discuss, you can table it and I can give you a number of policy alternatives which are not new, but which we have time and again outlined publicly for the consideration of government, but which they have stubbornly refused to listen to. We, we can For example, if you look at the um, speech delivered by um, our flag bearer for the 2020 elections, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, at the Ghana at the Crossroads event held at Kimpiski um, a couple of months ago, he outlined 14 policy alternatives for the consideration of government. What are some of them? Oh, he spoke about the need for government to cut down on expenditure drastically, not the cosmetic expenditure cuts that government has been talking about, which in reality amounts to nothing. And he spoke about government living within its means, cutting their coat according to the size of their cloth, which is right, which they should know anyway. He cautioned the president to cut down on profligacy, cut down on consumption-related expenditures, and invest in the productive sectors of the economy. Invest bold funds on self-financing projects that can pay for themselves. We've spoken about that. You understand? It was that, at that event that he also called on governments to put, to, to, to at least make a conscious and honest effort to reduce our rate of debt accumulation. And advise, in fact, a wise counsel that this government has stubbornly refused to abide by. And so I, can, I, I, I will refer all our uh, revered listeners and viewers to that speech. Go and read it. You will see, for example, our alternative on the very important issue of job creation. You spoke about our alternative, which, is, uh, which has to do with Ejumapa, creating one million jobs by creating a 24-hour you know, um, 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 job system where we are going to have two shifts and so on. You spoke about all those things. But because these people do not read, because they pretend as if they are the paragon of all wisdom, okay, they know everything, anything the NDC says is trash, they've never given us a listening ear. And so it is ridiculous for them to continuously on platforms like this call on us to give them alternatives. When they tell us every day that we are incompetent, we know nothing about economic management, and that they have the magician an economic whiskey, the Messiah, in the person of Dr. Bagumia, who, is, who has the magic one to turn our economy around. Now they are begging us for alternatives. And I'm telling them that if they go and read that speech delivered by His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, they will see at least 14 economic policy alternatives. If they go and read the speech that was delivered by a ranking member for finance, Dr. Atto Forsen at UPS, a program that was attended by Professor... Um, 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 Lord Mensah. Lord Mensah. A number of policy alternatives were given. In any case, on this particular issue of alternatives, what has brought us into this economic mess we have on our hands? It's not rocket science. And the solution is also not rocket science. What has brought us here is reckless spending and excessive borrowing. We are in this position because our public debt is no longer sustainable. Why is our public debt no longer sustainable? Because this Kufuado Baumia MPP government, when they took office and inherited a public debt stock of 120 billion, went on a reckless election, you know, related spending spree, particularly in the year 2020, when they decided to win that election at all costs, even at the expense of the economy and recorded an unprecedented budget deficit of 15.4%. At the time, our peers and our neighbors were doing deficits of below 7%. Again, 
even in 2018, the facts they themselves presented to the IMF when they went for the $1 billion rapid credit facility shows that they were spending recklessly because they had exceeded their own acceptable threshold of a budget deficit of 5% in 2018. They recorded 7.5%, 2019, 7%. If you look at the full picture they presented to the IMF, which took account of the financial sector and energy sector cost. Budget deficit for 2018 was 7.5%, 7% for 2019. Meaning that even before COVID struck, they were very reckless with their expenses. Now, that was what you know, crystallized in the year 2020, rich as climbers in 2020 when they, request, they recorded over 15% deficit. And that is what has created a hole in the economy. That is what has led to their reckless borrowings that they have nothing to show for. And that is why our public debt today has ballooned from over from 120 billion as of December 2016 when the NDC Mahama government was leaving office to now over 400 billion. And in fact, if what the IMF is saying as part of the debt sustainability analysis currently ongoing is anything to go by, that public debt stock will cross 450 billion heading to 500 billion by December. Because now, just like we have canvassed, you know, in time past, the Sino Hydro. Um, ESLA, Get Fund, Contingent Liabilities, Cocoa Board Loans are all now going to be added to the public desktop, making it unsustainable. And so we must appreciate the fact that it is this reckless spending of government, excessive borrowing that has brought us here. You reap what you sow, Alfred. I always say that. If you, if you, if you sow financial recklessness, you will reap economic mess. You will reap an unsustainable public debt. And so the alternative, the solution is simple. Live within your means. Cut down on your reckless expenditure. Cut down on the waste. According to the Auditor General, you have wasted over 60 billion Ghana cities on financial sector irregularities alone since 2017. Last year alone, 2021, we wasted 17.4 billion Ghana cities on financial sector uh, uh, financial irregularities alone. You have spent $2 million on a phantom SkyTrain project that has amounted you know, to nothing. You, you, you continue to abuse the public purse, traveling in hyper-expensive, luxurious jets at a high expense to the Ghanaian taxpayer. So yes, there are structural issues with the economy. Those structural issues have always been there. We were still exporting largely raw materials in 2016. Yet inflation rate was not 34% in 2016. By the time we were leaving office, inflation rate was around 15%. We were exporting raw materials in 2016. Yet our debt to GDP was not over 90% as we have now. Okay. Debt to GDP was 56% there. The city did not depreciate by 40% in 2016, despite the fact that we had all those structural problems. It depreciated by 9.6%, even before COVID. In 2019, the city depreciated okay. by 13%. You understand? So the attempt by miracle to blame, you know, our economic malice on structural issues and all that. It's neither here nor that those structural issues have been with us since the days of the Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. In any case, your party promised to transform this economy from a Gorgesberg economy to an advanced economy that adds value to what we produce before we export. And so if after six years you are still here whining and lamenting about the same structural issues you promised to fix six years ago, despite being the most resourced government in the history of this country, then you are admitting that you are a monumental failure because you have failed to keep the promise you gave the people of this country, which promise was to transform Sorry, the structure you. of this economy. Please, just, to, you, just two minutes up. to conclude. To run, up. run up. I'll go back to again, the again, again, again. You see, mm -hmm. um, to my senior brother, Mr. Jackson, we will continue to talk like this because that is the system of governance we have adopted for ourselves as a people multi party democracy based on the constitution, based on freedom of expression. The duty of the opposition is to criticize government constructively and to put government on its toes. And so, if currently we find ourselves in a situation of unsustainable public debt, with, with a very high risk of debt default, and the opposition is called upon to discuss that issue. The opposition cannot discuss that issue without pointing to the fundamental factors that has brought us to where we are, and to call out government 
for, 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 for how it managed those factors and to demand of government to do differently henceforth. When we do that, we are only living up to our responsibilities as a party. We are not necessarily engaging in it blinking because we all feel the hardships. And you see, and you see, look, look, if you have a finance minister who borrows recklessly on the bond market, borrows over eleven billion dollars. Because right. for every dollar he borrows on the bond market, he makes a commission for himself and for his family and friends and plunges this country into an unsustainable, you know, debt position because of that reckless borrowing he engaged in, which he benefited from. Are you saying that the opposition should not talk about it? Okay. Finally, Alfred, finally. And this is interesting. I need, yeah, I need, to, I need to move. This issue I, about your, your time is global up. factors affecting our economy. You see, we will continue to say the same things because the MPP continue to peddle the same lies. Okay. And so, and so no, no, Alfred, just 30 seconds. You have a lot of time today. This is the only no, topic no, we are no, discussing this is not the only So just topic. give me one minute. Just, just, so you just give me one minute. Look, in the whole world, out of the over 150 currencies tracked by Bloomberg, Ghana's currency is the second worst performing currency, second to the rupee of Sri Lanka. In the whole world, out of the over 150 economies tracked by Bloomberg, Ghana's economy is the second with the highest risk of debt default, second only to El Salvador. In the whole of Africa, out of the 54 countries in Africa, we are the third country with the highest inflation rate. Are we, say, are we living in another globe? Are we saying that these so-called global factors, COVID-19, Russia, Ukrainian war, affected Ghana more than it affected even Ukraine, which is at war with Russia, is okay. doing far better in terms of inflation rate, in terms of their debt position. They are number eight on Bloomberg's uh, um, external vulnerability rankings. We are number two. Why the bombs Putin is throwing to Ukraine? Are we having some of the bombs fall in Ghana here? So look, stop the flimsy and frivolous excuses. Accept that yes, there are structural problems with this economy, but those structural issues have been aggravated by the reckless spending and reckless borrowing you engage in in 2018, 2019, and especially in 2020. Let me establish and this. You are so that you, you have, you it's make reference to, to do with what the Auditor effort. General's report with the 17.4 billion. So as a result of the number of irregularities, cash, exactly. payroll, including and, $2 and million dollars paid for the, a phantom, you know, the procurement uh, irregularities as well. You continue to waste the public fact, that that and you. Sky train, um, the special purpose vehicle that was created and the $2 million that you both talk about is also captured in the Auditor General's report. But, Mr. Jackson, you, you talk about the specific interventions that have been put in place to address the situation where we are now, regardless of what the what, back what and forth will be. What are those interventions? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not aware of any. Listen, at this moment, <laughs> we've hit rock bottom. Right? Where we stand is this. Our debts are most likely un unsustainable. So we've got to, the, what we've heard and what we believe is that there's going to be some restructuring of domestic debt, which is essentially the government raising up its hand to say, you know what, you guys that I owe, I cannot pay. So you got to either give me longer time to pay, reduce the interest, or just forgive me some of the money that I owe you. That is the situation we find ourselves in. And if we're able to accomplish that, then we can go, we can get the World Bank to hold our hand, go to the uh, 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 foreign market and say, Ghanaians, the Ghanaian uh, 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 economy has done things wrong. And so please forgive them. <laughs> That's exactly where we are now. <laughs> We've gone to the IMF. You see, remember, I always say this. Stop making the IMF a bogey. The IMF didn't even come and tell you that this is the program you are bringing. They said, bring your program so that I will pour anointing oil over it so that you will go ahead and do it. The IMF is not a bogey. We mess up. We are indisciplined with our finances. And then 
The IMF comes to stand behind us to go and beg. If I misbehave and I go and call my uncle that, you know what? I owe, I can't pay. So come and stand behind me so that you can help me negotiate. My uncle is not the bogey. My uncle is not the demon. My uncle is not the person we should be angry with. What we should be angry with is that why are we so indisciplined that we do this over and over again? At this moment, we've hit rock bottom. When the, all these fancies talk about domestic debt restructuring, it's just one thing. I raise my hand. I can't pay. I can't pay. So those of you that I owe, come, let's sit down. Let's negotiate. That's why there's a five-member committee coming up. That five-member committee is going to negotiate how much pain all of us who have, give, who have given the government money, how much pain we are going to take. And bear in mind, I sat on this platform and said categorically that if the government of Ghana came to DLX, I would not lend it money. So Why? Some, oh. Because if you come, Seriously. listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> why? Let me explain. Let me explain to you why I won't let you. If you yeah, come to me status, and I look pay. at your at your uh, at your at your uh, uh, books, and you tell me that you have domestic staff you employ, and you use fifty five percent of your income to pay those domestic staff, and you already owe, and use fifty percent of your income to pay, so that already you are over a hundred percent, will I lend to you? So that in a sense. And, and here I'm, I'm, I'm being very cautious. Some of all of us may be complicit in com continuing not to, to encourage people to lend to the government when really we should be drawing back and saying that our government is not, is at high risk of default. Every time the rating agencies told us that the government was at high risk of this call, default, what did we do? We said they, are, they don't know their job. They are, uh, 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 we even uh, intimated that they may be racist and that maybe we should find a local agency, uh, an African agency to give us better ratings. Instead of addressing the issue, and every time we say Ghana is broke, it is broke. The numbers show it. So the chickens have come home to roost. That five people who are going to be appointed are going to have to negotiate how much pain all of us who have given our money to the government, how much pain we are going to take. Professor Lord Mensah, now there's issues concerning the direct impact of government's borrowing on the current state of affairs and whether enough has been done with specific interventions, which some of you were allowed sometime in March, about 12 points. In fact, the finance minister presenting the statement on the floor of parliament made some admissions about the limitations in some of those uh, interventions actually having any specific impact. For instance, the 30% cut on expenditure and so on and so forth. We didn't see a clear reflection of how that has benefited the state of the economy. You talk about how much we are losing in the Auditor General's report as captured, are there specific interventions you have seen implemented within the last six months to address the specific situation that we find ourselves in now? Yeah, I think uh, the finance minister is the key. I mean, clearly. And uh, some of the interventions were rehashed you know, in the recent briefing. I remember um, this 30% cut in, I mean, discretionary expenditure. And then also uh, looking at some key, I mean, purchases that the government needs to do that needs to be sacrificed. Like, for instance, buying new vehicles and all those. Now, you see, some of these things could be a microcosm of the entire economy. So even if you sacrifice them, it may not have impact. As we speak now, I can tell you that as we were downgraded, you know, at the euro bond market, that we were not having access, then the government started sitting up. And even before that, if you look at our current, um, the 2022 budget, which we had a review in July, the 2022 budget 
government foresaw that you know access to the international market is going to be a problem. So clearly, if you look at the financing of our budget deficit, they put more weight on financing from the domestic market. And I can tell you that they tilted it in such a way that more than 60% um, of the financing were coming from the domestic market. And that is why, you know, the appetite for the banks, the appetite for the financial institutions, and you know, they all sniff, you know, during the budget presentations to see what is in it for them. So if government provide a signal of spending, and the spending is tilted towards the domestic market, obviously it tells you that government is going to borrow from the domestic market more than the external market. And lo and behold, somewhere in March, we got downgraded. And so the focus of you know, the financing where, was on the local market. And as a result of that, interest rates started building up. Because, I mean, once government shows a signal of, you know, demanding more funds than even the private man, obviously, I mean, investors are comfortable lending to the government compared to the private man. So clearly it tells you that, fine, a lot of interventions were put in place. But these interventions are not interventions that can easily, you know, change the stature of our economy. Because the economy, the build-up of it has been that, Interest rate was growing because government, you know, has given the people signal that they always need money. If you look at our budget deficit before COVID, and then even the first two years, you know, uh, that is from 2016, 2017, 2019, when we were with the IMF, the budget deficit was fast penetrating, you know, that 5% that is, you know, required by the IMF. But then immediately we hesitated the IMF. It was like, you know, we, we, we are free now. So we can relax and then it expand in terms of our expenditure. So from that time, the momentum of our interest build up started growing. And as a result of that, interest bearing, you know, investment started growing. People started growing appetite for interest bearing investment. When it happens like that, Funds that are supposed to go into other businesses to create jobs will not happen. So people will start giving their money to the government. And the banks were taking advantage of that because the banks were happy that they were earning from the government, which was a mistake. Because if you are lending to, even if an individual person, individual comes to the bank and wants to borrow, you want to lend to that individual. You may want to do certain, you know, credit risk you know, checks to ensure that the person will be able to pay. At what point did the banks realize that government is likely to default? So for me, I think they made a mistake for concentrating chunk of their investment with government bills and notes. Now, if you look at what is happening on the ground as we speak now, government has no choice than to start negotiating on its debt now, especially on the international front. The domestic market, I would say that government needs to be careful because the domestic market has become more or less a lender of last resort to the government. For which, I mean, whenever the government is in trouble elsewhere to raise money, they find, you know, the domestic market to be the last place that if for nothing at all, people will still invest with the government. So obviously, we're going to see that kind of renegotiations where a lot of institutions are going to suffer on their balance sheet. Because if you take a typical bank in this country, if you take, you know, um, a typical pensions institution, and even for the pensions institutions, if you look at the NPRA's uh, regulation, the range and then the threshold within which the various pensions are supposed to invest in, chunk of them are supposed to go into government bills and notes. And so sometimes their hands are tied in terms of concentrating their assets more with government bills and notes. So I will tell you that, yes, most of these institutions are going to suffer because once government comes in with renegotiation, and let me tell you, somebody will say, okay, fine, it's going to be a soft kind of re renegotiation to make sure that 
you know, investors are protected and all this. There is no de debt restructuring that you will, there, will no, there will not be sacrifice. Definitely, a party must sacrifice in a debt restructuring. There's no way we can go into debt restructuring to say that an in investor is protected. <laughs> Even if your investment period is prolonged from four years to, let's say, eight years, it's still a cost to the investor. Because the investor knows how, you know, the funds that are coming to, the, um, to him within the four years will be used for. On the other hand, if the principal is cut or the interest rate is reduced, it's still a cost to the investor. So whichever direction we see it, we have to look at it as, you know, a situation where, you know, the investor must sacrifice. So the structures that have been put in place, I will tell you that they make, they're not making an impact because they're not structures that, they, the, the build-up has already been there. They're not mm -hmm. structures that we can say, oh, overnight or in a particular year, government is sacrificing 30% of discretionary expenditure. And as a result of that, we'll start having that kind of economic, you know, comfortability that is required. No, so, we so have to see it as a project. We have to see it as maybe five-year term project for which gradually, so if this year we're able to reduce our budget deficit for 30%, the build-up will be realized, you know, in the next year's, you know, budget or the next year's economic activities. So the decision that has been taken now is not something that we're going to fill it this year, let me tell you. So if government has reduced this, uh, has reduced this uh, discretionary expenditures, the build-up is going to be the next, you know, year where will be with the IMF, the presence of the IMF will also, you know, situate our budget lines to make sure that we don't spend to a certain threshold. And that is when we'll start, you know, feeling the impact of the decisions that are being taken now. So effectively, I will tell you that, yes, indeed, that decision was taken, but it's not a decision that Ghanaians are going to feel and say that government, you know, was not able to buy some, you know, new cars and all those government wasn't able to, you know, but government was able to cut, you know, budget expenditure to the two thirds of the targeted expenditure. So In effectively... Fact. Th that, yes. that, that was that, that was part of a number of measures, including, for instance, just shoring up revenue. They were not only looking at the expenditure side at the time the finance minister spoke in March. There were other interventions to show up revenue and also cut down on expenditure. So, for instance, you talk about the halting of importation of cars, 50% 50, 50 cut in fuel coupons given to government appointees, which the finance minister put the cost of about a little over $60 million, um, annually. And then also uh, they talk about the cut down on the 30% discretionary expenditure, which you've talked about. And then also the issues relating to the Ghana Revenue Authority's plan to begin taxing electronic commerce, which they expected to raise some uh, 2.7 billion CDs on the VAT on e-commerce in the next eight months. And then also the measure they announced relating to the specifics of this is in the finance yes. minister's statement. Um, he admitted that some 13.1 billion revenue that we was COVID-related expenditure um, had to lead to an increase in expenditure of 14.2 billion CDs. Now, th these specific interventions that were outlined, Professor Lord Mensa, have they impacted or made any significant difference, as we're saying now? Well, they have not. They have not. Um, because it's just, it has just come to position us, you know, to indicate or give the signal that as a country, we have learned from our mistakes. These are measures that, like I was saying, the momentum or the, 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 the feelings that we are having now are as a result of government previous, you know, decision when it comes to, you know, our expenditure lines and revenue generation lines. So whatever decision we are taking now are not something that we should anticipate, that we'll feel it this year. And I'm telling you that government found a way to enhance revenue generation. Government, as the finance minister even indicated that by saying, oh, there has been that kind of doorstep, you know, um, um, checkup on this uh, VAT um, 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 issues and all those. Yes. But then effectively, 
these are things that will build up into, you know, the necessary uh, um, need of money for this particular year of going into the last quarter. The effectively, the last quarter also comes with its own problem. And I'm telling you that whatever the case may be, government has positioned itself to indicate that, yes, we have made them, we've, we've learned from the mistakes that we made, we've put up mechanisms to ensure that, you know, we can enhance our revenue generation. Mm -hmm. We are putting up mechanisms to ensure that we cut down expenditure, but the impact of this expenditure cut are not going to be felt this year. They're going to build up into next year. It has to go into the next few years how this, you know, um, necessary measures that have been put in place, we can continue with it. Other than that, I mean, it will be just a decision that was taken for this particular year. And subsequent years, if we don't continue in the same line, there's no way we'll feel it. And like I was telling you, the situation we find ourselves in now it's not just, you know, a, a year's situation. It's a situation that has been built up over the years, and I'm expecting that this decision that has been taken will continue for Ghanaians to feel the impact. But for this year, we're not feeling the impact. So it is, it is a process, and it may not be... The, 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 the impact of this would not be felt in the next few months ahead of us. Mr. you wanted to make yeah, a good point. Yeah, that's, that's how I see. I, I see. wanted to make a short intervention. Okay. That if you look at the March interventions... Mm -hmm. The budget is a, the budget was a hundred point five billion. Yes. The interventions, at best case, would have resulted in three point two billion cities savings. Yes. That, that's so it. at that point, I have to, you have to ask yourself that where we were at that point is less than four percent savings, significant enough to make the impact that was required. And the simple answer is no. Those interventions were made to bridge the, the trust gap, that there was a sense that the government was enjoying while the rest of us were uh, 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 suffering. So we reduce salaries, we cut coupons, we do all those things where to address the uh, 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 trust gap, mm -hmm. not to make a significant 3% impact was too tiny. So uh, it was the optics, the signal that was supposed to send. The optics are also important. Mm -hmm. we, don't forget, they're also important. But apart from the optics, you also must take an axe to expenditure. And we didn't do that. Miracles. Alfred, I think um, Dr. Lord Mesa has basically rehashed almost all the things that the finance minister spoke about. He mentioned the the expenditure cut measures that the government has put in place, the moratoriums that the government has put in place. He mentioned the fact that these things are not expected to, you know, culminate within a year. If you remember correctly, he even mentioned that for us to even be able to get back into the international market, we are looking about three years and, and what have you. And also, if, even that timeline about, has actually been well, but, but at least been, the, been but, questioned. But at least that's, that, that, that's infeasible. That's, that's, the, that's the economics. There are various um, um, views and opinions on issues, and and. And he is giving clarity as to what the plans are. This issue of debt sustainability and all, he's been very clear that, listen, let's finish the DSA and then we'll know where, where, where we are. I don't think there is any departure, you know, from what it is that uh, Mr. Lord Mensah, and Mr. Dr. Lord Mensah and Mr. Joe Jackson has said this morning. These are admissions that the finance minister has made. There is quite some clarity in what the plans are. There is an understanding that, listen, all the measures that we are putting in place are not expected to, you know, culminate into direct impact immediately. But these are very necessary measures, measures to take. In all of this, it's very important that we, as we discuss how and why we are where we are, we take a look at everything in, in, in its whole, whole, whole sense. So I hear my brother speak, and he says that uh, the, the debt the debts issues are reckless and borrowing to fly. You know, these are consistent falsehood lies fabrication that it's always part of his notes he walks around every media house nobody takes and then he just puts them out there and and he expects that everybody should take a hook line and and sinker i find it very unfair on the spots inflicting this kind of falsehood pain on on the conscience of the people or the people of ghana can you mention one line one line one one credit line in this country that anybody at all has gone to borrow to actually fly a, a luxurious private jets you do that for the sake of, of politics or what? There is a public document. 
on every single loan that this government has contracted since 2017 till now. In fact, our debt stock includes their debt. It includes their debt. And he speaks about ballooning debt stock from 120 billion to what? Before the NDC came to power, Ghana's debt stock stood as a single digit, 9 billion. It is the NDC that moved the Ghana's, the Ghana debt stock from a single digit to a triple digit. They moved it from 9 billion to 122 billion. Now the question is this. Can he sit here and tell us what it is that they use the 122 billion, take the 9 billion out of it, that they borrowed during their period, what they use for in this country? This party, this government and people that is here trying to put falsehood out there, borrowed money to complete projects that they borrowed money for and they never completed. The Abetifi Hospital. And all those hospitals that they borrowed money for, ultimately you had them. They had to use some part of that money they borrowed for, for their own political research. This government had to borrow money to complete those projects and work on those projects. Where is the money? So you come to office, we own 9 billion. You borrow 122 billion, take the 9 billion out of it. I can't do the mathematics. And you move the country's debt stock from a single digit to a triple digit. Please hold on, to a triple digit. Without showing us anything that you've done. Now, I am here. This is the list of every single credit facility that this government has contracted since 2017. It is public knowledge. If you go to the Ministry of Finance website, it is there. He should show me which of them has been borrowed to fly private jets. Now, wait. We borrowed money and gave to get fund to put up infrastructure in senior high schools so that the 135,000 average of Ghanaian children who failed to go to school for lack of infrastructure during their period will now have places to sit. You remember, when we came to office and we introduced free senior high school so that every single child would not use money as a barrier from going to school. You remember correctly that during that period, that was when we realized that a lot of the children, even if they go to school, will not have desks to sit on. They will not have dormitories to, sit, to, to sleep in. They will not have dining halls to, to eat. This government had to go and borrow. We borrowed. So yes, the debt stock has gone up, but we borrowed and we showed working for it. We borrowed, gave to get fund, and today, Alfred, let me, let me settle this matter once and for all, please. You gave him a lot of time. Indeed. You but borrow, I, you, we borrowed. I I we borrowed. To ask a question, we borrowed. I would give you the time. We borrowed and we gave to get fund to, comp, to, to work on infrastructure for senior. And today, as we speak, an average of about 1.5 million Ghanaian children have gone to school without having to be cut off and stay at home for lack of infrastructure. But Alfred, we have yes, borrowed on that to point, We have borrowed. We are, let me end it then. You ask your question. On, on that we have borrowed. About the free senior high school. Don't, okay. don't let me finish that you ask me your question. Otherwise, we, you we digress. Will, we will, let me finish. We will, we will I want to settle already, this that has also credit issue. Questions we about have it. borrowed to complete the Pokwasi interchange. You know the Pokwasi interchange, immediately you mention it. Sami Jemfi and his friends, Felix Fusu Kwachi and Ko, go to Facebook and said, it is a Jomahama uh, 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 legacy. Now, the question you should ask yourself is, if you know that it was John Mahama, His Excellency, who contracted the Pokwasi interchange loan, but matured in 2017, why then do you go and tell the people of Ghana that we have overborrowed? If you know that Tema in Pakadan Railway was your loan contracted, but it matured in 2017, it means that you did it, but it hits the country's account in 2017. Why then do you tell the people of Ghana that we are borrowed? Why don't you tell them that the borrowing and the debt level that we find ourselves in include your reckless borrowing that you did November, December 2016 before you left office? Have you told them that? But you see, unlike you, who borrowed and you said you were going to complete five hospitals, including the Takradi European Hospital, which you never did, we have borrowed to work on these hospitals. You inherited Royal Hospital from the Eurojet project from President Kofor's time. When you came, the loan has been contracted. The money is sitting in an account. According to your own words, when the loan sits in an account, even a mad person, excuse my language, can actually do the work. When you came, you came and spent eight years, left office, Nobody knows what you did with the Aerojet loan that President Kufo secured for those hospitals. Today, are you saying we, that there's please, no record of please, what that do, do, were those projects completed? Do, were President Kufo's Aerojet project, we are completing all of them. Were those projects completed? Mention which of the Aerojet projects were completed. No, I'm saying, are you saying that there was no record of what the money the Aerojet no, was tell me, for? No, tell me. Because that Aerojet money was supposed to build hospitals, and the hospitals remained unbuilt until we came. So tell me what they used it for. How do you go and borrow money 
that you are going to use it to build hospitals, and the hospitals after eight years remain unbuilt, and you are telling me that they use it for what? So they should tell us. And then this same person sits on TV and confidently says that somebody else has borrowed recklessly. Let me tell you, each of the borrowing that this government has done has gone directly to fix the challenges of the people of Ghana. The development of the Kumasi Airport Phase 2, you can see that, right? The, the, the Upper East Region Water Supply Project that His Excellency the President opened a few months ago. That is what we've borrowed to do. You can see the Polytechnic and Technical Vocational Training Centers upgrading projects going on across the country. That is what we've borrowed to do. You can see the Obiche Bilamte uh, interchange going on. That is what we've borrowed to do. You can see the upgraded and enhancement of technical and vocational training centers. That is what we've borrowed to do. Now, if you go to the people of Ho, the whole central market, this government has pumped into it a minimum of 14 million Ghana cities through the Ghana Secondary Cities Project run by the Ministry of Local Government. It is a loan that this government took from the World Bank, gave to 35 municipalities to use to develop. So the people of Ho, if Sami Jamfi is telling you that we have borrowed recklessly, step out this morning, go and see the whole central market. That is what we have done with the loans. Enough of these lies, propaganda, and falsehood. The consistent throwing of dust into the people of Ghana's eyes. I okay. understand. And I hear Dr. Lord Mesa. I hear Mr. Joe Jackson. I hear them about the issues they are raising. And funny enough, if you read the finance minister's statement, there is no departure from what it is that Mr. Joe Jackson and Lord, um, Dr. Lord Mesa is saying. All finance minister is saying that, listen, reality has dawned on us. We are where we are because our debts are unsustainable. We need to find a way to be able to deal with it. Our exchange rate is bad. It is not doing well. We need to find a way to arrest it. And in doing this, these are the measures we have put in place. He mentioned the expenditure cuts. cuts. He mentioned the moratoriums, the various moratoriums that has been, has been, has been, has been put in place. Okay. He spoke about, please, and let me, he gave him a lot of time, you remember? Even when he said he was ending, he took another five minutes. So, so these things are things that the finance minister has already outlined and indicated. But please, the fact that we find ourselves in a challenge that we are now doesn't mean in any way that the NDC can come and sit on TV and call us out because in spite of all the challenges, Alfred, we are way, way, way better than them. What? Today in Ghana, we find ourselves in an economic challenge just as we, find, we found ourselves in 2013, 14, 15. And yet, we have our electricity on. Our children are in school. Private Anytime. sector is building factories oh, across the country. Okay, you see, when we get into these areas of what happened then and what is happening now, just as Mr. Jackson and Professor Lord Mesa have said, what the Ghanaian people are faced with today is the most important concern. What is being done now? to address this situation we're facing. Alfred, First we off, cannot... I'm coming on. Because you made reference to this EOJ project, I specifically asked you that question because these said nine hospitals that the, the money that was expected to come in, and which period did this Eurojet money come in? Mm -hmm. That's number one. Because mm -hmm. you know that during that period, the Arab Spring had an impact on that particular period as to when that money was supposed to be released. Mm. I recall that at that time, the government had to go to a particular bank here in this country, a local bank, for some engagement on this particular project. So I specifically asked the question about when that money came in and what the money is on record to have been used for. But you say that evidence has to be given. On this free senior high school project, the question is not about whether government shouldn't borrow, and I think that all governments borrow. The essence of the borrowing, Mr. Miracles, is I'm where listening. the concern is. The prudency, how prudent has the borrowing been? Free senior high school, we've gone back and forth with the engagement. Now we are at a point where even the president is talking about some engagement to ensure the sustainability of the free senior high school project. Are you saying that it was prudent to have started the project in this way, despite the concerns and admission of the finance minister himself, that if we continue implementing the free senior high school in its current shape or form, it will be unsustainable. It was going to be a huge, huge impact on government expenditure. There are challenges with this program. Parents are still having to bear a lot 
of expenditure. Even in saying that everything is free, people are paying. So why these specific borrowings and the investment you made prudent, that is where the underlying factor is. Mr. Miracles. So, so Alfred, if there is any Ghanaian who is in the hinterlands, in the rural communities, like where I come from, who could not afford, he had three children, and until 2020, could not afford to see two of his elderly children through senior high school. They'll be very upset with you this morning. Why? What is the essence of the state? The essence of the state is to provide the basic things for the survival of its citizens. So why Education remains one the, of them. The, 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 and the targeting can you, can you let me, where you identify can you, those who can pay can you let me, and those who cannot can you pay. Let me, can you let me, can you let me land? At the moment, the government's decision is that every child should be in school. And the government is committed in investing whatever resource that we find or we have in our children. The NDC can decide that when they come, they will cancel it, that's their business. We are convinced about it, we are committed about it. And if you, ask, if you listen to the IMF, they think it's a very good policy because it provides some universality. That is the only reason why I'm sitting here. If not for education, secondary education, I doubt if I'll be here. And so you can imagine if my mother had not done the sacrifices that he did and to be able to take me through it. So as for the free senior high school education, there's no question about it. The point I was just making with the free senior high school education is that it remains a fact that whatever expenditure the government has done, it has been done into the people and have the tallest year. Every corner, every cranny in this country, whatever investment, either it is money we have borrowed, or it is domestic revenue we have mobilized, unlike Sami Delphi and his party, we have put it directly and invested into the people. Every community, every district, every constituency in this country can point out to something. Not all, not all the things they are looking for, but can point out to something that it is that this government has done. And every loan, every single loan we have secured has gone directly to do what it is that is supposed to do. There can be varied opinions and views about free senior high school, but we, as a government and political party, we are convinced that whatever the sacrifices and the cost it is that this country will have to bear, there is no much sacrifice than investing in education. And that is not all. You would see what we are doing with the Agenda 111. You'd realize that we are building the basic the basic infrastructure for the services that are required for the citizens. There is no country in, this, in the history, there's no party in the history of this country that has said that deliberately at one go, at one point, we are fixing all the health infrastructure at the district level. And we are building 111 district hospitals across this country. By the time we are done, what it means is that when it comes to primary health care, in our corners and villages and rural areas, it would be covered. That having been done, we are doing the same for education, not just senior high school level. Go and see the number of infrastructure that has been provided through Get Fund. And if you remember the last time we were here, when the NDC were trying to lie around Get Fund and the Get Fund administrator intervened, he, told, he gave you the figures. The level of investment we have made in basic education infrastructure through Get Fund senior high school infrastructure through get fund and university infrastructure through get fund this government has fixed three major things that the ndc couldn't fix health education and okay. our energy how the much, reason we are here today of the borrowed funds have been invested in free senior high school how much how much how much are you how much of the, the time how time much of the borrowed are you funds are you have been invested i'm unable in to give you the exact figures as to how much is borrowed because free senior high school is all run on borrowed funds. And I'm unable to tell you exactly how much it is that the borrowed. But the point is that, be, no, the point is that, to that as one of the I said domestic revenue, money if you heard me, yes, money has been spent. Money yes. that has been borrowed has been invested. I, know, I said, you see, this government has spent both domestic revenue generated and loans contracted into the people. And I gave that there example. Was a specific yeah, no, and I gave and I gave example. You vote, so so you if you want to invest so I think it's very it's very easy to find those figures. And then maybe in your next show no, you no, can no, get those the, figures and then work on them. To that, no, no, you can always exactly find those figures. It is easy for you to get it is easy for you to get that. You can make you can make requests for it and move on. But the point remains yeah. The point before Sami comes in, please, you can't interject to me and let him come. No, He's forcing I you. Question. He seems you to be forcing me. you to. So, but the point, the point remains that this morning on your show, today is 1st October, I am asking Sami to go and say no more. This should be the very last time that he will sit on TV 
and or radio and try to peddle force with the lies that this government has for whatever reason borrowed money. Let me put it on record, then I end, that it is only the NDC that moved our debt okay. from a single digit, 9 million, 9 exactly. billion, Thank to 122 you. billion, Thank and cannot you. show anything for what they did. We can show okay. for okay. every single okay. money we have borrowed. Thank yeah. you. Um, Alfred, this is a very serious platform. We are not having a shouting match. We are having a conversation with a very informed and discerning audience. Make your point. And so it is very important that we stick to the facts and we allow the facts to do the speaking and not the screaming and the shouting and the snide comments and all that. First of all, I made a point that this government has been engaging in a lot of wasteful expenditure. And part of the monies that they have spent on these you know, misplaced priorities, like the rental of hyper expensive and ultra luxurious private jets by the president at a high cost of sometimes $20,000 per hour to the already impoverished Ghanaian taxpayer have come from bold funds. And Miracle comes in screaming and shouting that it is not true. For every money they have borrowed, there is something to show. It betrays his understanding of his own government's borrowing program. Look, this government, before it was locked out of the euro bond market, had borrowed in excess of $11 billion on the euro bond market. Now, every year, the monies they borrowed on the euro bond market, part was dedicated for budget support. What is his understanding of budget support? Are goods and services not part of the budget of government? The monies the president spent on private jet rentals, that is goods and services. For 2022, what is the total revenue projection for government? Originally, it was 100.5 billion, right? In the mid-year budget review, it was cut by 3.7 billion to 96.8 billion. That is total revenue projection. What is the debt service projection? If you add interest payment to amortization, it is 50 billion. That is a non-discretionary expenditure. 50 billion for debt service, interest payment and amortization. Then compensation, the salary of our public sector workers. It's close, if you add cola, almost 40 billion. You understand? So the 40 billion compensation plus the 50 billion debt service wipes out over 90% of our total revenue, which is 96.8 billion. When you are done with that, there is another non discretionary expenditure of 31 billion for statutory funds. Statutory funds, get fund, common fund, and all that which government must borrow to finance. In fact, as we speak, government is borrowing to pay workers for K1 and Q2, government borrowed to complement tax revenue to pay public sector workers. And so what that means is that anytime you see government spending on goods and services, which includes the huge amount of monies President Kufuado has been using to rent private jets, those monies include borrowed funds. I thought you were going to whisper off. It includes borrowed funds. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? So, you, 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 unless you don't even understand the debt program of your government and where we stand in terms of our fiscal position, and I'm saying that if you look at total revenue vis-a-vis -vis non discretionary expenditure, just two budget line items, debt service and compensation, completely wipes our total revenue. Uh, 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 uh. What that means is that for goods and services, for capers and all that, you are borrowing to finance that. And so all the monies you, you are wasting on private jets, you are wasting on Skytrain projects, borrowed funds. It is a fact. And to deny this and to shout and scream about this betrays your understanding of the topic we are discussing. That's number one. Number two, he says that it is the NDC that increased our debt from single digit to triple digit. But when you are servicing your debt, whether it is double digit or triple digit, it doesn't matter. Yes, when Kufo was leaving office, 
if you take out the debt we're forgiving as part of EPIC, our public debt stood about at about 9.8 billion. Professor Mills increased it to about 37 billion in four years. And President Mohammed's government added 57 billion dollars to it. And overall, Mills Mahama added about 111 billion. Oh, okay. So just just a little over 122 billion there. No, about. no. That, the public debt as so of December are, 2016, hold on, yes. let's go step by step, was 120 billion. Yes. Okay. It, it was, now I'm saying that out of that 120 billion, 9.8 was what was inherited from the Kofo government. Mm -hmm. So the mathematics he couldn't do, I'm doing for him. It means that cumulatively the Mills Mahama government added 111 billion. I'm saying that out of that 111 billion, about 37 billion of that was added by the Mills government. That's about 84, 84 billion, okay? It is 84, not because we borrowed 84. Of course, you have to add exchange rates, depreciation and all that. You know 84 that. billion you know that. added by the Mahama. My brother, when you were oh, talking, sorry, I didn't bro. giggle, oh, I didn't sorry, heckle. Bro. Let's yeah, have, yeah, sure, you know, bro. Bro. Uh, and decorum in the studio. Sorry, so 84 billion added to the public debt by the Mahama government. That gave us the 120 billion you inherited by 7 January 2017. As we speak, the public debt has crossed 400 billion. So if the NDC, Mills and Mahama government together in eight years added 111 billion to our public debt, and you in six years, not eight years, in fact the six years is not even up, you have added over 300 in fact, the last update, which was in March, was 393 billion. 393 billion. So, so that will even mean that you've if, added 273 if, billion. If okay. you subtract the 120 from 393, you've got 273 billion. I'm saying that the public debt since then has increased. Yes. This is as of July. Yes. Now we have crossed 400 billion. And if we are going to add Sino Hydro, S Line, and all those contingent liabilities that they were refusing to add to the public debt, when we told them they should be added to the public debt, they are crossing 450 already. So they have added over 300 billion to the public debt. So in terms of debt accumulation, you come nowhere near us. That's number one. Then he says that we have nothing to show for the monies we borrowed. Ah, is my bladder blind? Because if, if, I'm not sure he's even blind. Blind is not even a fair way to use because even the blind can see the 124 community day senior high schools that the ex NDC <laughs> Mahama government started. 50 of them were completed and commissioned. And today those schools accommodate over 1,500 to 2,000 students. We are talking about ultra-modern schools with libraries, ICT labs, and so on. Can you point to me one single secondary school that your government has been able to build and complete in the last six years with over 300 billion debts that you have accumulated in the last six years? One secondary school. There is none to show for. You are talking about expansion in already existing infrastructure in our schools with monies you borrowed on the back of GetFund. What government has not expanded infrastructure in our secondary schools? It makes reference every to that as evidence. Every government the, the, the has done so. In tertiary institutions, basic institutions, um, secondary education institutions, existing infrastructure, whether dormitories or classrooms, will always be expanded. But after you have borrowed in excess of 300 billion and increased our public debt so much, and even collateralized debt fund for 15 years for a loan of 1.5 billion dollars, you should be showing us more, more than just um, mere expansions in educational infrastructure. Show us one school you have built. And is that not evidence of the, the borrowing that they have engaged in? Expansion. If you look at the amount of money they have received, making them the most resourced government in the history of this country. He cannot be talking about mediocre projects like we have expanded six unique classroom blocks or dormitories and all that. Show us the secondary schools you have built. In terms of health, with the 84 billion Ghana cities the Mahama government accumulated in terms of public debt. Huh? Alfred, I can point you to the rich hospital project, 420 bed in Accra here. I can point you to the Dodoa Hospital, a hospital we started and completed in our time. I can point you to the University of Ghana Medical Center, the only quaternary hospital in the whole of West Africa. I can point you to 
um, 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 I will not even talk about the institutional hospitals like Ghana Maritime and Bank of Ghana. But I can point you to that uh, West Regional Hospital. I can point you to that uh, East Regional Hospital. I can point you to the ultra modern military hospital we started in the Ashanti region, Afari Sewa. I can point you to a number of hospitals, polyclinics across the country. Everybody can see it. I can point you to the rich Dubai, in, uh, uh, I mean, the Circle Dubai Interchange, the Kaswa Interchange. These are monumental investments in capital, uh, uh, in, in infrastructure that are paying for themselves, that have created jobs and have propelled economic growth. I can talk about the biggest factory in the history of Ghana, the Tuabo gas processing plant, which cost this country $1 billion and saves us averagely $300 million a year. So what is my brother talking about here? You have borrowed so much. You've gotten more money than oil money than anybody, more taxes than anybody. But my brother, you can't show us one hospital you have built, not one district hospital this government has built. He is a spokesperson for decentralization and local government. He should show me one hospital. The hospital they cut the sword for Ashama. It's been two years now. Go there. The land has been overgrown with weeds. Go to Labadi here. They pull down an existing polyclinic and promise them an ultra modern hospital. It's been more than two years now. Now you are talking about Agenda 111, a project you were supposed to have completed two years ago. Your president is even saying that the project cannot be completed by 2024 because you are having land issues. And that is what you are talking about. So that, clearly, that's the Greater Kwarizam Minister saying. Clearly, that. clearly he doesn't know what he's talking about. Then earlier this week as well. Exactly, yeah. exactly. All oh, these all these promises right. have become pipe dreams. Then, then, you, then you, you you hold on to that point because I you want to go I, on yes, a break and yes, come. It's, it's, um, but can I can I can I at least you, land? In fact, you hold, is it possible? hold on to it because you I will still come back. Give all he had a lot of time to talk, I'll, so I'll I need I need time to come back to you know respond. If you want to take a break, no problem. When you come, we'll continue. I need to go for this quick 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 break i'll be back and we'll continue this and getting to the measures that the finance minister outlined the seven pillars going into this imf program stay with us welcome back this is key point on tv3 we're live on 3fm 92.7 we're also live on tv3 ghana on facebook and i'm taking notice of all the comments coming through on whatsapp as well and on Facebook, appreciated. Borrowed funds. What borrowed funds are used for are extremely critical. You know why? Because it is you and I, people who are watching, you, you, we are gonna pay for it. We're gonna pay for every city in there. So the evidence of it is extremely important. And this is the finance minister talking about debt and its sustainability. We'll come back to Mr. Jackson, Sami Jemfi, and then Professor Lord Mensah on this. Take a listen. It's a prerequisite for the IMF program. Therefore, the IMF World Bank and the Ghana team are currently undertaking a debt sustainability analysis to inform the program negotiations. In addition, the IMF and government team are working to update the medium-term macro fiscal framework to inform IMF program design. That's the finance minister, Ken Oforiata. Jeffy, before we went for the break, yeah. we're making a point. And, and then I'll come and, to you. And, 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 I, I uh, like the fact that we are situating this conversation within the right context. Because sometimes people listen to politicians speak and they say, oh, it's politics as usual. This is not politics as usual. This is a conversation that concerns you. Because any monies that government borrows, we as Ghanaians would pay. We pay with our taxes. Future generations will pay. And so any conversations about how government has spent or invested borrowed funds is an important conversation for this generation and even generations unborn. And you see, if you want to see or know how a government has been responsible or reckless with regards to how it has utilized borrowed funds, there is an index for that. That index is the amount of money the government spends on capital expenditure as a ratio of its GDP. So GDP to KPES. And when we were in office in 2016, check, what was the ratio of KPES to GDP? 4.5%. Since this government took office, it's been six years. KPES you mean capital expenditure. Capital expenditure. Monies mm -hmm. that are invested in the building of roads, schools, hospitals, So airports, that's the evidence so of exactly. the borrowing. We were People doing 4.5%. People should be able to see. 
4.5%. What you have used our money for? They have been doing 1.5%, 1.8%. They have never crossed 2%. Okay? In every sector of this country, you can point to tangible projects that are products of the investments of the visionary nation builder, His Excellency John Dramani Mama. If it is the aviation sector, today we can boast of the best airport in the whole of West Africa because President Mahama took a strategic, strategic decision to support the Ghana Airport Company to retain 100% of the IGF, which gave them the capacity to borrow on the strength of their own financial books to build Terminal 3, which today is paying for itself. That is what visionary leadership is about. It was through a similar arrangement that we supported the Ghana Post and Harbour okay, to engage NPS to expand the Tema port, which today has made it the biggest port in the whole of West Africa. Look at the thousands of jobs that has created. And so, I've spoken about the Tuabo, I've spoken about schools, I've spoken about hospitals. You have nothing like that to show for. You are talking about irrigation projects in the north. You are talking about free SHS, which, when you were exposed, you later conceded, is not being funded with borrowed funds. So what have you used your borrowed funds for? They borrow on the bond market, and they say we are using it for budget support. And the budget support goes into consumption. It goes into wastage. And so don't be surprised when the Auditor Generals tell you that in one year alone, this government wasted 17.4 billion, 2021, on financial sector irregularities, and 12.2 billion in 2020. In fact, if you put together what they have lost to financial sector irregularities and corruption alone in the last five years, it is over 60 billion. You understand? And that is what we are talking about here. Again, my brother made a very false statement, false statement that I think he must apologize for before we close this program, if he has a modicum of integrity in him. He said that when we took office, the Eurojet money, the loan President Kofor's government had procured a loan for the Eurojet hospital projects, and that the money was sitting in an account. My brother, what account was that? I'll tell you. It when Why it is it that you people can lie like that? I'll tell you when it gets to The truth of the matter is that with regards to the Eurojet oh, project... I, I asked for, I asked yes, for evidence. Only okay. which it failed woefully to provide because am there is no such evidence. Am I the one to provide the because evidence the for fact, the money that you took? Can you... Can you, can you, you ask me a question? Okay, can you on. respect you know, the rules of... Okay, move show? on, move on. You continue. Alfred, <laughs> the Eurojet project was given parliamentary approval. But even the contracts were not signed under the Kofor government, let alone funding secured under the Kofor government. The contracts for those nine hospital projects were signed in 2010. Funding, which was supposed to be raised by Eurojet, was gravely affected as a result of the Arab Spring. We all know that. This is trite. It is, I think I made reference it, 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 to it that earlier. It is illiterate for any body who follows the political space to even make this statement you're making because it is trite it was big news in this country when as a result of the arab spring that funding instrument or uh, uh, the, the, the system that Euro just sought to use to raise funds for the project didn't materialize and we know that they had to take the Mahama government to issue guarantees and promissory notes in 2014 to backless bank plc and other partners of Eurojet before funding was secured so for the project. So where's the money? Look, so you lied. So where's the money? You lied so where's the money? Shame so where's the money? Said, okay. So you have the money. So where's the money? So stop so, misbehaving. So Let's have gentlemen. a decorous program. I didn't Hold interject on. when you were talking. I'm saying okay. you lied when you said mm -hmm. that when we took office, there was money sitting in government's account mm -hmm. for the Eurojet hospital. <laughs> Look, to settle this matter, I will read to you a publication on Eurojet's own website dated monday 23rd june 2014. the headline 2014 is eurojet committed to completing work on the nine hospital projects on schedule now the story reads eurojet the invest essay a multinational company involved in the construction of a number of health facilities in the country has assured government and the people of ghana of their commitment to complete the contracts on schedule despite a few challenges now it goes on and on but just the relevant um, portions. On funding, Eurojet, or let me just read this, the second paragraph, the company was awarded contract in 2010 to construct eight hospitals for the Ministry of Health and a 500-bed military hospital in Kumase for the Ministry of Defense, 2010. How could funding have been secured in 2008? Then the relevant portions. Um, 
See, when you lie on programs like this, you always have X all over your faces. Um, <laughs> let me just, yes, on funding, Eurojet mandated Barclays Bank PLC, UK, and APSA Capital South Africa to raise funds from the international market. A strict payment procedure will be applied to the contractors and strictly approved by the Project Implementation Unit of the Ministry of Health and Defense because we are giving them that promissory, you know, no. So you lied and stop peddling falsehood. In any case, I am saying that after accumulating so much debt, more than all governments since Nkrumah put together, after having unprecedented oil revenues and unprecedented tax revenues, you are the only government in the history of this country who cannot point to one single hospital you have initiated and completed in six years. Even the military giantess we had did better than you. Even the champion did better than you. So you, you should be the last people to be talking about infrastructure. And then my brother, he says that uh, in spite of all the challenges, the NDC should not make a mistake to call us out mm -hmm. because we have done way better. Way better. Way better according to whose word. Let's look at what the neutral arbiters are saying. What, what the sovereign credit rating agencies are saying. The economy we bequeath to you, which was projected to grow by 8% in 2017. Hmm? Alfred, that economy was rated by Fitch, Moody's, and S&P as a B- minus economy. Your economy, as we have now, has been rated below junk status, a baller economy. In fact, this economy stinks more than baller. The economy we bequeath to you had access to the euro bond market. You have been long locked out of the euro bond market for years now. The economy we bequeath to you had inflation of 15%. You have inflation of 34%, the worst in the last two decades. You can't even pay public sector workers. You know that for almost a year now, this government is unable to pay the SNIT uh, deductions of public sector workers. They owe SNIT over five billion. As I speak to you, there are over 100 billion unpaid bills sitting in the books of the Minister of Finance and other NDs. You owe local contractors 70 billion. You owe get fund three billion cities. You owe road fund two billion cities. You owe the common fund and other government services another 10 billion 100 billion so in the and you have no shame report, you are still here shouting okay. screaming when that, people cannot find you he talks about industrialization of what use is industrialization when the rate of unemployment has worsened from 8.4 percent as at 2016 2017 to now 13.4 percent and so finally Finally, because I know that you don't have time, but you gave him a lot of time. I don't, I don't, I can't say say as a pity, so I don't, I don't mind if you give me, you know, relatively small time. But I, I, I think still, that we, we, I think my the, point the, is still the, made. But the you see, allocation of time has been you see, fair. you see, no problem, very fair. You are always fair. The issue about expenditure cuts, I want to make this point that what government has announced so far, mm, which Prof has outlined, has to do with expenditure cuts of our allocations, expenditure allocation cuts. It doesn't mean that the outends will reflect those cuts. Okay. It is the allocation that has been cut. And if you look at the total effect of that, that is just about 1.8 billion. But don't forget that as a result of COLA alone, the wage bill has gone up by 4.6 billion. Don't forget that total revenue has been cut by 3.7 billion. Don't forget that interest payment has gone up by another 3 billion. And so there is a shortfall of 10 billion. Government doesn't know where they are going to get the money from because he left Yamutu. Now they say they are only going to All rely right. on oil rainforest and all that. So this expenditure cuts we are talking about will not amount to anything. And finally, their intervention. You see, you've asked questions about we should talk about solution, solution, solution. But I was totally appalled and scandalized when I heard the finance minister talk about a Ghana miracle. You see, these guys are hopelessly inept and clueless. So we are actually that they have getting no solution for the economic to malaise that, they have that, that as to, through their own that, that particular area. That the that, finance minister, the finance minister, we, after that, hold on, the that, finance that, minister. That's actually the next. Exactly. The but next let, me, conversation. let me make this point. It's important. Um, it's because it? Professor Lord Mensah has. Oh, let me just to, make this to, point. I'm landing in 30 seconds. I'm landing in 30 seconds. I'm saying that. I'm you on that. After throwing Kenke and Wache parties to celebrate borrow wins that he profited from. He is telling us that, oh, we should be expecting a Ghana miracle in the nature of the Irish miracle. By the way, the Irish miracle, Afrin, did not come about through wishful thinking. Neither did it come about because Ireland had a finance minister who fancied okay. white clothes. 
the, 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 the in fact, if you look managers. at the 2021 Auditor General's report, the SNIT is owed some 4.33 billion. And this year they have added 2 billion. And in 2020, 1 billion was paid. But in the 2021 Auditor General's report, the 4.33 billion is what government owes SNIT. And this year, and I'm saying and that this year, 2022, they've added at, another at 2 end billion. Of financial so it is year. even so, more than 6 billion. What that means is that. Public sectors are breaking their back working in spite oh, of all the excruciating actions in the Benza. country. And yes, yes, at the end of the month, uh, government so is not even able to pay their slates. You in are the sitting end, on all the, that the, What is now important the is the impact talk. of this borrowing and how prudent this borrowing has been over the period. And this is what the, the back and forth has been about. But from your own analysis of the trend of impact and how prudent some of the borrowing that has been engaged in are, could we have done anything different to at least address this situation of the increasing debt stock and which has gotten into some unsustainable path? The IMF now is doing the debt sustainability analysis. Could things have been done differently? It's muted. It's muted. Professor Lord Mensah, if you can so unmute. Right. Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me, please? I can hear you clearly, please. Right. So, um, if you look at our first access to the euro bond market, you know, that was in 2007. And um, if you were to pick up the prospectus that, you know, normally we use in our borrowing, this prospectus says 2007 that we borrowed. That was the President Kufo's time. Always indicate that we're going to borrow to offset existing debt. Okay? So that tells you that the first borrowing that we did, we cannot even pinpoint exactly what we did with the money. Now, I always say that because of the borrowing that we've been doing over the years, which has been serving as easy access to, you know, foreign exchange into our market here. We've sacrificed that borrowing to, you know, um, some of the policies that are supposed to, you know, enhance our export, i.e. improve on our export so we can generate more dollars into the system. If you listen to the finance minister's uh, statement, he was talking about, you know, balance of payment, you know, shortage, which at the end of the day, access to the euro bond market could have helped us to show up our balance of payment. I was asking myself a question that, why would we borrow before we can show up our balance of payment or be sure of, you know, our uh, um, dollar buffer? As a country, when we borrow, right, what we're supposed to put the money into are supposed to be things that can pay for itself. Because even in our host households, if you borrow, you borrow purposely to uh, put into something that you are sure. So for instance, I put up my first house when I came to Accra. I borrowed, and then out of it, my rent that I'm supposed to pay every, you know, month, I use that money, you know, top it up a bit to pay for, you know, this money that I borrow. So obviously, it tells you that whatever you are borrowing, I mean, it has to go into something that you can easily pinpoint. And I like it when um, you relate the capital expenditure to your borrowing because the capital expenditure are assets, are going to create assets that you can rely on. And out of this asset, you can easily pinpoint exactly what, where you can raise money to pay for this debt. Let me give you a typical example. Sometimes we compare our debt to Europe. We compare our debt to America. America can boast of a debt of about you know, 100% of their GDP. Japan can boast of a debt of about 120% of their GDP. 
Now, the question we need to ask ourselves is, what asset do they have? And though that asset ability to generate, you know, uh, 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 revenue to pay for this debt. If you borrow a permanent debt to construct railway line, effective railway line, from Accra to the north, which is going to distribute in terms of, you know, goods and services across the nation, I can tell you that you can borrow up to 200%. Nobody will complain about it. But then a situation where you are borrowed, but then subsequent borrowing that you go and do, all the prospectors that you take to the euro bond market indicates that you are going to borrow to offset existing debt. That tells the investor that you are borrowing, but the monies that you borrowed, you are not using it for a purpose that is needed. Exactly. Okay? So effectively, the investor will lend you money. And let me tell you, those investors who are out there, those pension institutions, those uh, financial institutions who are prepared to give us money into our environment, the asset they are managing is not the entire asset that they place, sorry, the, it's not the entire asset that they invest in Ghana. They invest just a small fraction of it for the reason being that the interest we are going to give them as a result of the way we put up, you know, our prospectus, and as a result of the way we manage our debt, the interest is so high that even if they invest in our environment, and then we pay the coupons, the first few coupons they, we pay is enough for them to recover the amount that they've even invested with us. So effectively, it tells you that, you know, the market was open for us. At the end of the day, we did not do our work well because we've never indicated that this money that we're borrowed, we are coming to borrow again, but the old one was into this, you know, asset, and the asset is generating enough revenue to pay for, you know, that debt. That is why I have always been requested for debt profile to look at, you know, the debt that we've been borrowing in the past. We should seize the borrowing, and if I were to be, you know, the, the finance minister now, that we were stopped from going to the euro bond market, I will seize the opportunity for this year to ensure that at least I profile all the debts that we've been borrowed since 2007 that we went to the market, to look at where we invested this money and see if possible, some possible revenue generations may come up from some of the assets that, you know, we, we borrow from. But then, for the signal that we get out of the prospect, prospectors that we've been presenting to the market every now and then, it tells you that, you know, Alfred, we've borrowed, but then we cannot identify what we put the money in. And I can tell you that the asset, even if we can identify what we put the money in, the asset quality of the, uh, those, uh, um, 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 you know, debt that we borrowed for, those asset quality has been compromised because of what? Leakages in the economy. So you go and borrow maybe one billion for roads. The money that will end up doing the road itself because of corruption and leakages will be around 200 million. And with the 200 million, it will not be able to produce a standard of road that will sustain itself to pay for the seven year debt that you've gone to borrow. So maybe the 200 million goes into roads, mm -hmm. and then it will end up, you know, doing a road that can last for only three years. Within three years, we have to borrow again to revamp or rebuild the road again. So the system that we find ourselves in has never borrowed and use it for a purpose that you know the funds that was you know borrowed for you know that uh, we we went for the went to the market for. Uh, okay. So effectively. It tells you that, you know, that? we have problems yeah. when it comes to, you know, our debt. Mm -hmm. I'll come back to you on this. So it, it's all about the, I mean, and I keep saying this when we started this conversation, that all governments across the world, not just going to borrow, it is the productive outcome or the venture that the said money is put into, which is the most important yes. thing, and being yeah. able to measure the impact of our borrowing. Mr. Jackson. Exactly. Really. That's how it's supposed to be. 
So if you go and borrow from the international market purposely for road, the tolls that you put on the road should be able to accumulate and pay for itself. But then the unfortunate thing is that, you see, we are not able to segregate the purposes that we borrow for. Because we go and borrow as a country. And that, that was why I was happy with the initiative at the time, some time ago, that, you know, various state agencies are going to be empowered, right, to ensure that they borrow on their balance sheet. And as a result of that, it will make the agencies responsible. Okay, Mr. So, let Prof, me give Prof, you an Prof, example. Prof, 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 hold on to that point about the segregation of the borrowing, how we're going to approach things differently. That was a proposal then. But clearly, yes. we did not follow yes. through to ensure that that was done. Yes, we never, we never. There was a change in government then. Yes, Mr. Jackson. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, you see, we, uh, at this moment, mm, we've borrowed recklessly. Nobody can change. And uh, 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 Sami, for your information, we've been borrowing recklessly for a long time not just in the last six years but we've been borrowing recklessly of course with it i always say with each iteration the problem gets worse and worse at this moment we can't borrow anymore we've been locked out of the euro bond market guess what i say Hooray. you're happy you see the the problem with the euro bond was that they give you the money and there are no you can really do what you like with it so you can take that money and and spend it anyhow you take that money and you put it into the pot called uh Ghana's budget because anyway part of that budget is what they call budgetary support and and it goes into the pot and it can be spent anyway maybe it's time for us to draw back maybe it's time for us to say you know we can't keep borrowing at this level those of us that and, and the haircut is good because it will bring home to all of us how much we have misbehaved how f much we have been fiscally reckless the haircut for ordinary customers of the banks no it is the haircut for those who are holding government who have essentially uh, 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 lent money to the government so for everybody the haircut is saying that if you gave the government of Ghana, you bought either a bond or you bought treasury bills or whatever you gave to the government of Ghana, that adds up to estimates of around 190 billion. Those who are holding the paper, right? You're holding government uh, 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 paper, which means I'm holding an instrument that says that on the 10th of October, government will give me a hand, uh, 100,000 CDs. That paper, you have to take some sort of pain. What is the pain? They either reduce the interest you're earning, they will make it extend it, or they'll say, If I, you know what, instead of giving you a hundred and three, let me give you 53. We don't know yet. So these are all conjecture. And the, and the Minister of Finance says they're going to elect five people from the key stakeholders to negotiate this event he also said uh, it's also clear to us that some of the banks are holding huge sums of of this government paper they're holding huge sums of government paper because really it was easy it was an easy way to operate you you take money from your your uh, depositors be it surplus current accounts or savings accounts or fixed deposit you take it and you flip it to the government which is almost at that time regarded as risk free and the margin is huge and we continue to do that in spite of the fact that the government increasingly was over leveraged or had borrowed too much and the challenge now we have is that we see we are at the point where we can't even stop borrowing so the difficulty now is that if you make this haircut too difficult and people stop lending to the government the government may even right grind to a halt because as it is today if you're holding money would you lend it to the government today nobody will, nobody will with the prospect of one day treasury bill is going for 31 percent yes and above 
So, can I chip in? Yes. You see, the difference between the kind of borrowing we engaged in and what they have done in the last six years is that our borrowing was capital expenditure focused. Their borrowing has been largely consumption focused. Again, apart from the debt reprofiling uh, Prof spoke about, you recall the sinking fund we set up, the $500 million Ghana uh, cities we put in there to repay the first 750 million euro bond that was issued by the Kofor government. Clearly, this was a government with a foresight to even make savings to repay euro bonds that had been issued prior before, uh, uh, prior to its coming into office. So Sammy, clearly, Sammy, sometimes, Sammy, okay, sometimes it's you. not very fair Sammy, right, when you lump Sammy. all of us okay. together. I hear you. Because Sammy, you know that okay. these guys I, 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 have been very, very reckless. And I would admit, yeah that the sinking fund was yeah. one really good initiative. Very nice. Nobody can deny that. But the challenge is that, Sami, let's do something constructive. Now, it is about this country, Ghana. It is not about who is. It's about we have an existential threat. We have a threat that could derail all the hopes that we have. We have a threat that could even result in a security crisis. So we have to fix this thing, yeah. right? And one is that, please, let's all understand that this haircut may be necessary. Ish. It may be painful, but it may be necessary. But we can afford it. Okay, but hold on, hold on, Sammy. Sammy, whoever bought so much, no, whoever, so no, 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 the government has actually held up his hand. As Ghanaians, we must be prepared to take some of the pain. Those of us who give money to the government, we must be prepared to take the pain. We must also, it's a difficult thing to say, but we must have, we, we must have hope and believe that this negotiation will end up well. We must also understand that we are going to go through a two, three year. I, I like what uh, 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 Professor Lord Mensah Lord Mensa said. He says a whole program where we know that Yaboka. So every year we are putting aside so much to bring us back to where we were before. But most importantly, I hope we learn from the, from the recklessness of the last few years. Hmm. Uh, but that is whether the evidence. That is key. No, that is, is key. Whether we learn from it. Uh, has, Ms. Jackson, does the evidence, does the to evidence suggest recklessly. that they continue to we waste those borrowed funds? Have actually learned. Lent. You see, At least with the initial ah, reactions so see, to up, the. Up, up till now. Spent it's almost like time. every time we fall Sky into chain, trouble, Phantom we can Sky get chain. away with <laughs> it without any local pain. This is the first time, right? that the pain will be widespread. People will see value lost. Hmm. So if we don't learn from this, then I don't know what we can learn from again. And this will be catastrophic for the banking sector. You see, it, it, will, it will not be catastrophic if it is negotiated in a certain way. So it, can't it will be painful, approach. but not necessarily catastrophic. Professor yeah. Lomensa, but yeah. I'll, I'll come to you. I just wanted to settle on this. So no, it's, a, a it still rises and falls on, on the, on the a approach. A bit on the haircut. Yes. Yeah. A bit on the haircut. You see, um, it's quite sensitive. Very, very technical. It's not just a matter of sitting by the table and saying that we are negotiating on interest rate. I mean, you have to reduce yours by 3%, or maybe, I mean, we're going to reduce it by 5%. Now, if you look at the balance sheet of a typical pension fund, or the balance sheet of a typical bank in this country, their asset concentration are into government bills and notes, and to some extent, in the bonds. Very high concentration. So, if we are not able to negotiate very well to assess the level of you know, capacity that 
you know, the, the, the banks will be ready to receive, okay, to assess the shocks that the banks will be ready to receive, not to distort the entire financial space, that would be very, very fine. It's not just a matter of saying that we are reducing it by 3%. If you reduce it by 3%, and it turns out that the bank's assets are, you know, get deteriorated, then you're going to have much problems in the financial space. So it's a matter of, you know, getting to know the technical threshold of interest that you can cut. It's not a matter of just, you know, cutting anything anyhow. I want to Thank refer you. to one of I the see. pillars the Minister of Finance talked about, mm -hmm. which he talked about financial stability. So in, 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 in essence, this negotiation is going to take place with a key eye to how far can we go without bringing down the system? How much pain can these institutions take without collapsing them? Yeah. So that's where we are. And that's why he will talk about one of the pillars is uh, 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 financial stability. Uh, and and, and, and uh, of course, one of the pillars also has to be restoring us back to the point where we start to grow properly again. And we need okay. to stop the conflict. Yeah, exactly. Interest. So the, the, the issue is about the... It's not fair for the man who has brought the, us to where we are to be the one leading these efforts. When he has profited from so, this problem. So they are... Can come back. Can come back. can come back. He didn't profit from this. He can come back. Sometimes when you see... You know when you listen to this talk. Sometimes when you speak... So can which transaction advertise can? Yes. They put which one? 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 Destroy the yeah. economy, and now can I? Can I? Can I, I, I must yeah, take the better for okay, your time. So, your so, time. So, can see, I come in? It still boils down to it's the approach, fair. and that's what you and Mr. Jackson have been talking about. If there's going to be any any impact in the uh, debt restructuring, because I look at the Bank of Ghana data, for instance, as at the beginning of the year, the government treasury bills and bonds form nearly half of bank's asset portfolio oh, as, yes. at the, as at the yes. end of 2021. Yes. So this is about 46.2% <clears throat> from the 43.1% on account of the 29% year-on-year growth. This mm. per the analysis of this data that I'm seeing right now. Yeah. Now, if this is, it has actually increased over the period, what should the approach be so that the banks who have heavily invested in government bonds and treasury bills do not take a hit because we are still sensitive after this financial sector cleanup. We're still recovering from, from the impact that everybody else felt. Yeah, so if it's a question to me. Yes, and then, to Hello? Know. Yes, Professor Lord and Mensa. Yes, so what is happening is that <clears throat> we may have to look at the bank's you know, margins the spread that they are going to enjoy on some of this investment that they did with the government. Possibly reduce it in a way. So if it turns out to be on higher side, they can, you know, reduce that kind of margin and then, you know, be able to absorb some of this haircut. Other than that, the banks may have to reflect back to their depositors who invested to them and then by so doing, doing all lending to the government. So, the starting point should be the margins that the banks were going to enjoy from this investment. If it turns out to be, let's say, 6% margin, how prepared are they, so, uh, are they ready to go to, let's say, um, 3%? So then the banks will absorb the shock at their level. On the other hand, they may have to, if they are not prepared to absorb this shock, then they may have to pass it on to the depositor. So if me and you, we invested with the bank, and the bank is promising us, let's say 23%, we may end up getting about 20% in terms of, you know, percentage. So effectively, it has to do with the readiness of the bank to absorb this shock at their level or pass it on to, you know, the depositor. But let me chip in this. You see, the restructuring process is not much of a problem. Therefore, the restructuring also. But then what normally fails most countries is the post-restructuring. You see, the restructuring sometimes will come and give the government that kind of free space to borrow again. 
So if it is a government that does not listen, then we'll end up compiling more debts, which become more dangerous, you know. So effectively, whilst we are looking at this restructuring, we should look at how we can manage the post-restructuring as well. That is, after the restructuring, whether the government will be key enough to pick from the lessons that has been learned so that we tone down our borrowing, at least cut our quote according to you know our size. And I believe that at that time, we'll still be with IMF. That right. in immediate term, maybe one to three years, we should be able to manage the situation. But after the IMF, whether we'll still manage the post restructuring very well or not. But like okay. I was saying, it behoves on the bank to absorb the shocks at their level. The Jackson knows about it. And then possibly, if they are not able to receive all the shocks, they can do hand in hand, maybe absorb part of it and then pass the, part, uh, the, the other part to the depositor. Professor Lord Mensah, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Jackson. D just to add something to what he said, a little complication. Rewind to a few years back, right? Banks were asked to increase their capital to 400 million CDs, right? And that worked out, give or take, $100 million. Today, the 400 million CDs is worth only $40 million. So at that point, remember that what has happened with this uh, uh, drop in the value of the CD is that even the shock absorbers are not as strong as they used to be. That's what we also have to bear in mind. But it is not impossible. And I believe that over the next few weeks, we're going to get a lot more clarity okay. in this issue. Uh, the timelines set by the Minister of Finance are aggressive, but we believe that he set those timelines with his eyes wide open. And we remain cautiously optimistic that they can meet those dead, uh, timelines because the situation is dark. Marcos, you wanted to respond to a few things. Alfred, I mean, I'm going back to, to, the, to the, some of the issues because, you see, I have insisted. I'm surprised Ami is trying to tell me the tone I should use. I'll continue to scream and rant until he stops the falsehood and the lies. Listen, free senior high school and all of its accompanying infrastructure that we have today is as a result of our commitment towards ensuring that comprehensively secondary education becomes accessible and affordable to the Ghanaian child. So if you come and sit here and say, you haven't built any school, you haven't done anything, apart from the fact that you are lying, and you are putting out palpable for, I've just shared pictures of completely new secondary schools we have built with your producers, and I'm hoping they'll show it, and I've told them <laughs> that they should roll it whilst I speak. Completely new secondary schools. Okay. I've given I it to the producers. Uh, now, first of all... I think that we, we reserve... First of all... ...of our production. Well, yes, but I want to put it on record. What to do. You are taking my time. Yes. I want, I want to put it on record that, that I've yes. shared those pictures with them. When you go to La Laribanga, there's an Islamic school completely built. First school for the people of Laribanga. <laughs> when you go to Nalirugu, there's a freshly built secondary school for them. Abomosu SHS. Have you seen that school? The Abomosu SHS alone is 30 e-blocks put together. What they call e-block is nothing but a classroom block. It is not a secondary school. It is just one of the infrastructure that we have in a lot of the secondary schools. The, a lot of the e-blocks that they speak of, we have had to come to come and add even the, some of the auxiliary facilities to them to make them operational. Again, Sami Jemfi has the fixation of constantly putting out lies and falsehood and wants everybody to take, let me tell you, there is nowhere that in this country the NDC completed 50 e-blocks. It's a lie. It's a falsehood. It's a consistent lie he's put out there. When you go to Parliament, Alfred, don't interrupt me, please. When you go to Parliament, when you go to Parliament, the official documentation is there. And when you get to Parliament, you realize that the NDC completed only 29 of the e-blocks they started. Get Fund started 101 of the, those e-blocks. And then World Bank contributed to the rest. You'd realize that it's a total of 125 e-blocks that the NDC started. As at the time they were leaving office, they had only managed to complete 29. 29 of those blocks. So if he says they borrowed the money, where is the money? We have had to come to come and complete those 30, uh, those, uh, we've completed almost 30 blocks in addition to their 29. <laughs> now the point is this. You sit here, you speak of debts, and yet you refuse to tell the people that the, the e-blocks that you built in the bushes, hundreds of kilometers away from the communities, without dormitory blocks, 
You left them there, and this government has come to, to complete them. I have just given you a list of secondary schools that have been built by this government from scratch to correct that falsehood and consistent palpable lie. For some strange reason, he's been saying this lie for five years. And for some reason, my party and my government has also refused to call him out. It is a lie. It is false. All the communities I have mentioned to you, when you go to those communities, you see the school. But let me even tell you something. It is senseless. It is completely senseless to come to a district like mine, where I have 13 secondary schools, 13 secondary schools, and say that your solution to providing space for children to go to school is to go and build another class school building kilometers away from, from the community. Go to Okwapman School. The level of infrastructure in Okwapman School alone, classroom blocks, dormitory blocks, dining halls, is about 20 of E blocks put together. If you want, tomorrow, send your cameraman to Okwapman School. So if I have space in a secondary school like Okwapman School, there is so much land, even today. And I, my vision is to provide the access for children to go to school. You think the most sensible thing is for me to go and build an e-block in Mangwase without a dormitory block? How would the children in Okopong be able to go to Mangwase? And that is what this government is seeking to avoid. And that is why a lot of their e-blocks are still stuck in the bush, completed, and yet children are not attending. Let me also address this very, very important. And I'm, I don't know whether your, your producers would scroll the, the freshly built secondary schools that I showed to them. Alfred. Uh, Let me also I, I, indicate. I think that, uh, yes. Um, Maybe later, if you can do it now, you can do it later. It is going to be, it's, it's been acknowledged. Yes, They've acknowledged received, that they have it. He's received awesome. Awesome. those awesome. pictures. Just awesome. Good. It. Now, 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 you see, let me, let me also, you, why, why is he? No. Mr. Let me Mr. also make this point and make it rightly so. All the loans we have contracted since 2017 are here. And these documents are in Parliament. And when you go to the Ministry of Finance website, it's there. Go and pick each of them and see whether these loans that we contracted have been used for the purpose for which we build or not. The Ghana Secondary Cities Project, $150 million, 35 municipalities. I have given you an example of who. Go to Sunyane. Go to Sunyane. Go to Sanarugu. Go to Koforidia. Go to Oda. These are projects out of this particular loan that was contracted by the government of Ghana. And these are into production. When you take a loan and build road, what is it? When you take a loan and build road, what is it? When you take a loan and build Tama and Pakadai railways, what is it? When you take a loan and you build Pokwase Interchange, what is it? When you take a loan <laughs> and build, build Obichebi Lamte Interchange, what is it? So these are real investments that the government has made. Can contract alone, please. I'm not done. Right, thank you very much. I'm not done. Uh, these are loans. These are, these I'm are loans. The time, these are loans that, that the government has taken. Each as we run. No, but he can. He spoke first. No, I, I will have clear. to speak last. He spoke clear. first. In, in, in a lot, a lot he of spoke time. first. I, I have to speak last. The viewers who have followed this will be very, very honest about the time and allocated to both of you. Yes, finally. Number one. I think the verdict around this table is very clear by majority of the the panelists here that this government has been very, very reckless in its borrowings. And that is what has plunged the country into the economic mess we have on our hands. And so for holders of government securities who are going to take a haircut, meaning they are going to lose their money, they should know those responsible for their predicaments. It is none other than the cousin of President Kufuado, Ken Uforiata, who profited from borrowings that he himself led through his company, the Data Bank, as a transaction advisor, Charles Adubwahe, and especially the Bawumia led economic management team. Because these were the same people, Alfred, who told us in 2016 that a public debt of 120 billion was too much, that Mahama was borrowing too much, and that Yetisikasos were come there. The money is here. We don't have to borrow. They will borrow responsibly they will reduce the rate of debt accumulation. So if our public debt has ballooned from 120 billion to over 400 billion, if debt servicing has ballooned from about 10 billion to now 50 billion, a 500% increase, if debt to GDP has moved from 56% as of December 2016 to now over 
and our economy has moved from B minus to now below junk status. It is the handiwork of Ken Oforiata, Dr. Bawumia, and Nana Adodanko Kufuado, and they must be held responsible. As for the lies Denis continue to peddle, we don't have to give him any attention. You know why? Because the people watching us are descending and can read <laughs> in between the lines. You have sat on this platform <laughs> and lied. That when the NDC took office in 2209, we had money sitting in an account for the Eurojet Hospital projects. I have proven you wrong. Because you have no humility and integrity in you. You have not even been able to apologize for that. You have no shame. The whole school projects you are sent to your producer, and I'm very happy you didn't show it. Go to Abumusu and find out when the sword was cut for that project. Can you imagine? The sword was cut by his excellency John Can you imagine? All the okay. schools you have Can you imagine? are all projects Alfred, that have their roots have the last in one. the okay. next okay. NDC Mahama government. My brother, can let me, you let me put it on record. Speak? Why are you so jittery any time I'm speaking? Why are you always behaving like a witch uh, uh, in the Holy Ghost field church you have, when I'm speaking? You have, Can't you, you be have, coming you and have, I have my time now? Let, let, let me make minute. my point. You gave me five minutes. Yes. Let me have because my five minutes. Because you it's, it's a minute left now, for you now, to run. Now, he speaks. Okay. You see, okay. shameless okay. people, so, they speak so, about, so, we have so, borrowed for Pokwasi interchange. We have borrowed for Obechebi Elamte interchange. This clearly means that this man sitting here has no respect for truth. Because anybody watching me, just Google it. Because of time, I can't do that. Google it. Parliament approves loan for Bechebilamte interchange. Pokwasi interchange. All that was done in 2016 under the leadership of His Excellency John Dramani Mahama. So my brother, you have very little to show for the unprecedented resources you have had. For the records, the whole market project was built and almost completed under the Mahama government. All right. Abetifi was built under us. You should have completed it by now. Today it is at the mercy of the weather because you abandoned it for years. You should at least have some respect for the people of this country. Some the people of Labadi, the people it, of Shama, who you have deceived. The, you promised them hospital. National Communications you Officer of the NDC. To provide this. And, uh, let me say this. Dennis Miracles, and you, were to, you, you were supposed Alfred. to... I, I just wanted to put and this on the record. You were supposed, and supposed and to come in. in we have early. Up. It's a border I was economy. supposed to start with you, but you were supposed you, you told me you were supposed to start with you. You, you, you want to wrap up? What? So you told Dominic, me you were supposed to start with you. Apologize for the lie. Dennis Miracles Abwaji is a director of local government decentralization and rural development at the presidency. Professor Lord Mensa, thank you. Jojasi, thank you very much. Thank you for watching Key Points. My name is Alfred Okonsei. Have a good weekend.